I guess I could have made my way up here while that song was ending, but. All right. We got time for some testimonies. Let's glorify God. Is God moving in anybody's life today? We got, we got a, our man with two microphones back there. Two microphones, guys. Two testimonies at once. We can do this. You go first. I've got some. No. So, first off, actually, um, actually, do you want to give a testimony? Of course. I mean, I'm looking past you. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't challenging you, I promise. <laughs> but my testimony could be his, if Alejandro's, if he wants to give it. You want to thank God for anything on this particular day? Yeah. All right. Will you thank him for the church, or do you want me to do it for you? Uh, he performs in front of hundreds of people. so Thousands. He, well, he's not wrong. So, uh, it's my birthday today. I'm 11 now. Um... What else do I say? <laughs> Got something to thank God for? Yeah. Thank him. Uh, uh, God, I thank you uh, that it's my birthday. Amen. <laughs> very good. We're just very proud of him. We're proud of all three of our children. Every single one of them was a miracle in a different way. You know, it's... It's funny how, you know, God is such a teacher. You know, he, he, he wants to teach us something about himself. And so in every child, he's taught us a different lesson. Amen. You know? Amen. So we learned three lessons. Tad and Carrie <laughs> learned eight. <laughs> you know? But... It's just different every time, and we're just so thankful for Alejandro. He's been a true blessing. He has. Anybody else? I just want to say that I believe that God is working in my life and that he is walking with me through my grief, and I feel his presence. My children and grandchildren have been a blessing as well. But I do feel he's uh, working with me. I have a long way to go, but I know he's working with me. Thank you. You were going to do it. Let's do it. Let's go. So I found out. Um, indiscreetly, that my company is being bought out. And, of course, Satan comes in. He gives you that fear. And I'm a ball baby. <laughs> but um, God has given me peace in this situation and so much knowledge <laughs> that I already knew, but he just, like, brought it to the forefront. And I meet with the person tomorrow who's taken over, and I just... I thank God because I believe it's going to be a good thing. I still don't know where it's going. I don't know where it's going to end. But I know God has me the entire way. Amen. If I can get it out. Um, first, I'm grateful that he's brought my niece and my great niece here again today. So... Um, and my friend Matt back there, so, but Will brought him, so we remember that matter. Um, but also that I've learned through God not to be like Lot's wife and keep turning around and looking backwards at everything in my mind. And that, you know, that isn't where I was supposed to be, that's just where I was passing through. And that there's things going forward that are going to be much brighter and my heart is full right now, so that's 
About all I got for today. Do have something to. We do have something to talk about, but um, she said she's none for two months. That's what she said. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, but uh, we, we have time for one more, but we do have another thing that we need to address as a church family, as a church body. So uh, we only have time for one more, but does anybody have one more for us? As we arrived in Springfield um, Monday afternoon for a follow-up with, with the surgeon, um, smelt maybe like coolant, but the car wasn't rushing hot at all. We drove the other five, six miles to get to um, the hospital. Uh, had dis some disappointing news uh, w with the surgeon. I ha will be facing another surgery. Uh, but... Um, in checking the car before we headed back, we ended up after the third stop had a nine hundred and eighty four dollars and some cent estimate to replace the radiator. Older son rented a uh, vehicle dolly here in town, come and got it. We are driving it now after spending less than twenty six dollars. Amen. That's a temporary fix with, with the um, stop leak, but at least it, locally it, it's, it's fine and good. All of that, our replacement costs here locally with some help uh, of free labor is going to be less than $200 instead of almost 1000 That's awesome. So um, we've got one more, and I'm going to call it a testimony because it's going to be. But it might not be right now. You know, there's, there's been a common phrase in worship mu music lately. If it's not good, then God's not done with it yet. And that's true. But one of our church family um, is currently in jail. Josh, uh, uh, he sits with these two lovely people every week. And uh, he went to California to a rehab recently. And he's come back strong. But it turns out there were a few warrants that were outstanding from before that that came to call. And so now he's sitting in jail when where we really want him is helping take care of that baby. The bond for him, um, and our pastor actually spoke with the bondsman, and the bondsman said, I, I even feel like this was just an honest mistake. So... Um, but the bondsman, nonetheless, it's, it's going to be $4,000 for bond. And, um, well, well, I don't know how else to say this. We'd, we'd like some help, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um... Anyway, what we're wanting to do as a church is take up a love offering for our brother, if we can. Um, now, we recognize that we're a small body, and $4,000 is probably not going to happen from us, but every, every dollar really matters right now, especially. Uh, we also know that this is coming as a shock, but I don't, I don't want us to be like, ah, you know, if you have it next week, bring it next week, because I think that... I have never, I have been inside of a jail once, and I wouldn't have wanted to spend one night, let alone, you know, every extra night there is just not what we want. That's not ideal here. So um, what we have decided as the leadership is if you don't have what you wish you could give to help today, if you would get with a member of leadership, so that's me, Shane back there, Linda over here, Bootsy and Alma over here. Um, if you could tell us, okay, uh, tomorrow I can have something, I just have to get to the bank, and let us know and get that money to us, then, then we'll, we'll take that and we'll start gathering that up together. But if you do have something today, please, uh, offering buckets have envelopes. In this case, get it in an envelope and then write for Josh or for Bale on there so that we can, we can help get our brother back where he needs to be. 
So we appreciate it. Okay. With, with that, that business hopefully taken care of, because the fact of the matter is God is good. God is going to take care of this. God knew this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen at a time that we really didn't feel like was opportune. And he knew that, but that's because with every baby, he's got a new lesson to teach us. And he's going to teach the lesson. Right? Yeah. It reminds me of the pit test, honestly. We talked about that recently. You know, when you're walking right and everything is like, I'm really stepping into what God has for me, and now you're sitting in a pit somewhere, you know? God is, God is absolutely good. I'm going to rearrange some stuff over here so that I'm not, you know. All right. So today uh, is, is actually really opportune. <laughs> this is a good time for this message. And it's, it's funny how that works. It really is. Because sometimes you, you hear very clearly from God, like Psalms 33, go, <laughs> you know. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're just like, oh, I saw this, and that was kind of cool. So I'm going to make a message out of it. And then people come to you that whole week and tell you why this matters right now. Yeah, <laughs> Left and right. <laughs> um, so last week, though, I do want to point this out. Last week, and of course we weren't here, but, you know, YouTube. Uh, last week, Pastor Jonathan talked about authority. Now, because we've been talking about walking in obedience, that's not going to work, I'll leave it over here. We've been talking about obedience, and, and obeying authority is a super American problem. We are so not good at listening to authority and hearing authority, and that's very important that we learn to develop that sense of humility, that sense that says, I think that what this guy says is 100% wrong, but he is my authority figure, and I'm going to honor him in the name of Jesus, who sent him as well as me, right? But there's another side to this, because there are actually things that we give authority that don't deserve it. And, there, and no, I'm not talking about presidents and kings and things like that. I'm talking about there are other things in our lives that, that we give authority that never merited it to begin with. So this week, we're talking about taking authority over the things that God gave us authority over. Right? So this is, it's not, it wasn't meant to be a flip of, of what Jonathan was preaching, but it worked out that way. <clears throat> So, in order to start this, though, I want to, I'm actually just going to read this, but the, where this came from is from uh, something that I read in Hebrew in the Bible. And so, I wanted to point out that the study of Hebrew, for me, has opened up a whole new wealth of understanding of the Scriptures. I think this is because it forces me to slow down and focus on the revelation of the Word to me as I read. I have a tendency... Uh, to read really fast. Um, uh, it, I'm not going to say it's a mark of pride with me, but it, it kind of became that way. You know, in school I was a fast reader, so what I really wanted to be was a faster reader. And I read really fast, and what that does sometimes is cause me to skip over words and even entire phrases and just get to the next section and read. Um, what this causes me to do in the Bible, though, is accidentally I wind up skipping words and phrases. That's bad, <laughs> you see. Um, but reading the Bible in Hebrew doesn't afford me that luxury. Now, the reason I'm always talking about, I, I wanted to point this out too, the reason I'm always talking about reading the Bible in Hebrew is because the Bible was originally written in Hebrew. That's the language. It was not written in English. It was written by people uh, several hundred years before the English language was even invented, actually. English did not exist when the Bible was written. Um, so it was written in Hebrew originally. Now, when I say that, I mean the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew originally. Uh, the New Testament was written in Greek originally. And so when you hear Pastor Jonathan say, um, in the Greek this word means, he's not just throwing out like a random language. It's because that's what it was originally written in. So we're, we're tapping into the original 
meaning of the author. I think sometimes that we as pastors get into this discussion of, well, in Hebrew it means, and in Greek it means, and nobody ever like slows down to explain that that's, that's because that's what it was written in originally, you know what I mean? And sometimes people might get left behind. I, I had a student just the other day uh, find out that the Bible wasn't originally written in English, and he was like, huh. You know, so it kind of caught me, you know. So if you didn't know that, now you do. If you did know that, then, you know, you knew it. But um, it was simply translated to English. The Bible was translated in English multiple times, I might add, by different people. And one of the things that I think is important about that is none of these translations really fully encompass what's being said. They don't do a great job. They're just translations, right? So when we read it in its original language, we we get a better understanding of what's actually being said. Now, the reason that it's been translated so many times and we have so much trouble with it is because English and Hebrew are vastly different in expression, and uh, no translator has ever been able to do this 100% right. The way things work, the way things are said, the way meaning is attributed in these two languages, like more so than English and other languages. If it had been originally written in Italian or Spanish or German or whatever, it wouldn't be this bad. But Hebrew is vastly different from English. Now, I want to point a couple things out here on the side of this. This does not mean that you cannot gain revelation through a translated Bible. God is that good. If you translated the Bible into any language, He can still talk to you in it. If it's translated badly into any language, He can still talk to you through it, and He will. It does also not mean that if you perfectly understood Hebrew, that you would perfectly understand the Bible. Because generation after generation after generation of people that speak Hebrew from birth are still talking about what it means and still getting new revelation from it. The reason for this is because God has an infinite amount of things to say to us through this. So what we got from this is there was something in Hebrew that I noticed in the Scriptures that was very interesting. But most of this I won't need to go into Hebrew for. It was just, it's just the final ending of it that I think is very important. But today we're talking about authority, as I said. So one, a couple of, just a couple of examples, things that you have been given authority by God over. Right? So when you're, when you're asking yourself, okay, what are, we, what are we talking about? I have authority over things, and I said it wasn't presidents or kings. Uh, demons. Amen. You have authority over them. They don't get to tell you what to do. You get to tell them what to do. They got to go. You say, hey, leave. They leave. The Bible says that Satan himself, simply by you resisting him, flees, not runs, not walks, flees. The old boy scrambles away from you because of the authority that Jesus put in you. So there is authority that you have. Yes, when you're dealing with all of the issues that we deal with as humans, take it to God. Please do. He wants to deal with it with you. But don't forget that you have already been given the authority to tell them to shut up and to leave. You can even, you can even and, we, and we do this, you can even bind their tongues, literally forcing them to not speak. You have that authority. Yes, take it to God. Do. He, he, he is the source of the authority. Take it to Him, Right? But remember, he already gave you the authority. Take it. Use it, right? Uh, the other is you have authority over health. That's why there are healings in the Bible. Because when God says, be well, you are well because of his authority. And when we as his, 
disciples say, be well. You will be well because of that authority. But your authority does not override God's will. Just to add this kind of other side to it, right? So if God said that person needs to be sick, that person's going to be sick. Now, I don't believe that God says, I'm going to make this guy sick. I think that we get sick because we get sick. But I think that sometimes God says, I can't heal him because something, right? Sometimes it's because we don't let him. Sometimes, but I think that we get so caught up in this like lack of faith idea, like you didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. I mean, the Bible says if I had the faith of a mustard seed, I could move a mountain. But God's authority and God's will, He knows what's best. And sometimes He says, I love you, but I can't heal this one. You know, And that's a hard thing to come to understand. And if you're not at the place for that one yet, I get it, because that's a long road. I didn't like walking that road myself, but it makes sense. Anyway... Um, but specifically for today, this is, this is what was huge to me, specifically for today. You have authority over you. Psalms 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Could you go back to the first part of that? We actually, we got a song on this one, right? Praise the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, right? He's commanding his soul here. He is actually talking to himself. He is saying, whoa, he feels something else. And he turns to his soul himself. And he says, hey, praise the Lord, my soul. All of my inmost being, he's commanding his very organs. That's what that word means, the cut of the organs, to praise God. Everything I've got. Praise the Lord, my soul. And then, and this whole rest of the psalm, he keeps saying, you, your, you. He's commanding himself. He is taking authority over his feelings, his emotions, his desires, his temptations. And he's saying, uh, you're going to do this. So, who, uh, so not only that, but forget not all his benefits. He's reminding his soul don't forget who God is, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. See, he's still talking to himself, his own soul. God is doing all of this for you. Remember it. Right? And then redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, satisfies your desires with good things. Satisfies your desires. Aren't our desires not always good? Right? We have temptations. Uh, fleshly desires are not always good. Right? But God satisfies your desires, but with good things. That was not in my notes, but I just thought about the, profan the profoundness of that. You know, He's like, I know you have desires, and they're not always good, but if you'll give them to me, I will actually satisfy them, but with the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> Whoo! so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. See, in this point, he's actually telling himself what to do. He is overriding the way he feels in this moment so that he can overcome how he feels in this moment and giving it to God. Now, the next one is Psalm 42. These are just examples right now. In this one, uh, yeah, he says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. So first, he actually addresses his soul. How often when we're feeling these, these negative feelings, 
do we just kind of sit and stew in them, you know? He actually, like, he's like, wait a second, I don't feel right. I don't have permission to feel not right. And he turns to his own self, and he says, whoa, 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 hey, soul, what you doing there? Why are you feeling this way? Why are you disturbed within me? And then he commands it again. Put your hope in God. He is commanding his own spirit. Put your hope in God, for I... Now, see, see, he is separating himself from his feelings here. He is saying that my feelings, my emotion, my current state of being, that isn't me. Because I know that I am a child of God. And so when these feelings come up, they're not me. They're sin living in me, according to Romans chapter 8. Right? And so he addresses that. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're feeling downcast. Put your hope in God because I will yet praise him. I'm going to continue to praise God. So feelings, emotions, inner being, catch up. Because that's where we've decided to be today. I am taking authority over my feelings and my emotions, and I am saying, no, you don't get to define my reality today. God did that, and that's what I'm choosing to follow. We have heard so much about anxiety and depression lately, and I'm not getting into the medical de- de- definition, okay? I'm not getting into the need for medicine. I'm not dealing with that, right? I'm dealing with, uh, we, we have so many conversations about these two things. But anxiety and depression are exactly what he's talking about here. See? My soul is disturbed within me. Anxiety. My soul is downcast. Depression. See? And something that has happened, especially among the younger generation, and I've seen it start to creep into older minds as well, is this concept that those emotions define me that I don't have control over those emotions. Well, the Bible says that's not true. The Bible says I have authority over how I'm going to feel today. So when I am feeling depressed, why, my soul, are you downcast? Put your hope in God. Authority over your own emotions, your own spiritual well-being. Why are you so disturbed for those with the anxiety deal? Why are you so disturbed? Because I've put my hope in God today. So you don't get to define this, right? Your imagination and your feelings have no authority or right to define reality. And they also have no authority or right to define God. If you have an image in your mind of God that is angry, that's not God. And your imagination doesn't get to say he is. So when you feel that way, when you feel like, I just feel like God's mad at me. Well, factually, that's not true. Factually. And since that's not true, you can tell your emotions that they need to shut up. Because they're wrong. You have the authority to tell your feelings what to do. And hopefully, what you're telling the bad ones to do is go away. (laughs) Leave, right? Now, some people, though, and I I do think it's important to address this. I've got a reminder here. Because sometimes people say, I am firmly convinced that God is mad at me. I am firmly convinced that God has not forgiven me. I am firmly convinced that God has not forgiven him. I am firmly, that firmly convinced, right? So if somebody came to me and said, your son, on the day of his birthday, you know, uh, went and uh, pulled a knife on somebody and said, give me your wallet. I'd say, no, he didn't. And it's not because he's my son. I'd say, no, he didn't because I know my son because I spend a lot of time with him. And because I spend a lot of time with him, I know who he is. 
And since I know who he is, I know he did not do that. If you said he did some other mean thing, like he roasted me in front of my fellow classmates, I'd be like, yeah, he probably did. I'll deal with it, right? If, if, he was, if he was kind of picking on somebody or saying he was better than somebody, oh, yeah, yeah, he probably did. I'll take care of it because I'm, I'm a good dad. I'm going to discipline when he needs discipline because that's a good dad. That's what God does with us, you know? But I spend time with my son, so you cannot firmly convince me that he did something that I know he wouldn't do. That same idea goes with God. Spend time with God. If you're firmly convinced that he is mad at you, spend some time with him. What you're going to find out is he's not. Because that's not who he is. That's not what he does. Countless times when bad things happen, people come to me and say, I just feel like this is my fault because I insert blank, right? I'm the cause for this bad thing. And don't get me wrong, sometimes we are the cause. But when that voice comes and it's not letting you go and you really didn't have something to do with it, it wasn't you. But you have firmly convinced yourself and you need to get with God so that he can go, no, you you didn't do that. Don't worry about it, right? Because that's not who God is. God doesn't punish other people for your sin. He'll punish you for your sin, sure enough, right? But he's not punishing other people because you did wrong. He doesn't work that way. So how do we spend time with God? Bible time and prayer time. You need both. As you read your Bible, you're going to learn who God is. He's going to reveal himself to you. That's what we say. What that means is you're going to learn who God is. And as you start learning who God is, you're going to be like, wait a second. I don't feel like God's the kind of guy that would be mad at me for this. Yeah, that's because he's not. It's because he's not. He's not that guy, right? I might be that guy on occasion because I can be hot-headed. I just but I'm not God. I, I want to tell you guys about him, but that doesn't make me him. I want to teach the greatness of God, but that doesn't make me better, right? I'm still human, so I might, but that doesn't mean he does. It's not who he is. And prayer time, when we think about prayer time, we, we tend to get lost in this idea of uh, thinking out loud and saying that we're talking to God. No, you're thinking out loud. God can hear that. (laughs) But that's not what your prayer time is. See, what I do, you don't have to do this. What I do is I set an alarm. I set it for 15 minutes, not at first. At first, I set it for five minutes. And I sit in my prayer area, which is the floor of my bathroom. I, I I put a pad down. But that's crisscross applesauce right there on the floor. And that five minutes is God's. I talk to him. I try to listen to him. I ask him questions. But I don't fly off into areas other than that. Like, like my prayer time is about getting in with God and God's plan. So I don't start thinking, well, maybe when I go to school, I'll teach it like this. Or maybe I'll teach it like that. God, what do you think? You're thinking out loud now. God's not worried about how you're going to teach a class. <laughs> God's worried about your soul as a soldier in the army of the kingdom of the Almighty, right? That's what that time is for. Lord, what are my battle orders? When I go to work today, I need you with me, so I'm going to stay really connected so that when I get there, I'm ready to do what you need me to do. But I set mine for 15 minutes. You get more, all of a sudden that five minutes feels like nothing, and you're like, oh, I needed more than that. Well, fine, set it for 10. Set it for 15. You know, keep building up on it. That's fine. But what you'll find is God has so much to say. And you'll find that every time you sit down in that spot, all of a sudden you just feel better because you remember, this is where I hear from Him. And it puts me together so that I'm ready to go. And then what I do, like I said, I wake up 30 minutes early. So 15 minutes is prayer time. And what I'll do is I'll, take, I'll pick a verse. 
so that I have something to kind of guide my prayer time. You know, I'll read one verse from uh, Bible Gateway, whatever the verse of the day is. It kind of guides what I'm praying about. And then at the end of those 15 minutes, I reset that alarm another 15 minutes, and I read. Now, I'm reading straight through, but, you know, as time goes on, that might change. But I read this, and at the end of those 30 minutes, whatever my perspective was before I walked in there, it is not that now. Because God will shape you. And when He does... Then, when the enemy comes up to you and says, mm, God's mad at you, you didn't say bye to that person right, and it was really awkward, and God is very upset about that. You go, no, he isn't, because I know God. There's a Western. It's called Appaloosa. And there's a scene in it, and I told my wife, this is exactly what I want our relationship to look like. But in that scene, this guy has a wife, and then his best friend. And the wife is not the best person, behavioral-wise, right? And she's trying to separate this friendship. And so finally, she looks at her husband, and she's like, he made a pass at me. And the husband looks at the friend, and he goes, no, I did not. And the, friend looks, and, and the husband looks back, and he goes, no, he did not. That's good. <laughs> because they know each other well enough and they trust each other well enough. God wants that relationship with us. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want the ability... <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> to clarify, what I mean is, if somebody accused my wife of cheating, I want us to have the relationship where I would go, and she would go, no, I did not. And I would go, no, she did not. Now, to further clarify... In 15 years, we've achieved that relationship. Amen. We have exactly that. God is good, and he wants you to be convinced that he's good. Because that way, when the enemy shows up and he says, mm, God's upset at you, you can go, mm, no, he is not. It's as simple as that. Now, this is where the, the Hebrew part was important. We're going to go through uh, these verses of Psalm 77. We're going to hear this. We're going to internalize this. We're going to learn something from this. Here we go. So the first thing he does is he sets up his situation in this psalm. This is an instructional psalm. This is a song that is designed to remind you how to deal with these emotions. That's what it's for. So... First, he says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was distressed, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I'd like to Hebrew that for a second. What it says is, and my soul refused to be comforted. I know that, well, and then I'll read three also. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. And then after this, he says the word salah. We don't really know what salah means, but it's probably a pause. So we stop here for a second and we think about what was just said. How many of us have been in that position? I cried out for help. I don't feel any better. Nothing changed, by the way. I'm still just sitting here. It's still bad. I cried out for God to hear me. He cried out twice. Every time there's a repetition in the Bible, that matters. He's saying, no, really, I cried out. Like when you say it one time, it's like, oh, God, help me. But the second time, when he says it twice, he's like, no, 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 no. I want you to be very clear. God, please, I cried out. When I was in distress, I, I sought the Lord, and at night I stretched out. They pray like this. Now, it depends on the culture, um, like this, more or less, but always palms up because this was the symbol of guilt in Hebrew culture. So God can already see it, so you, you show it to him when you pray to him. 
right? That was their culture. But what he's saying is, my arms didn't even get tired. I was like this all night because I couldn't get tired. I couldn't sleep because I'm miserable. There's no answer here. And his hands are just out and they're not even tired. He's doing everything he's supposed to do, but he doesn't feel better and nothing's changed. He says, I remembered you. That's what I'm supposed to do. But instead of feeling better, I groaned. You see, it's not working. He says, I meditated on your word. That's what that means. I was reading your word and I was thinking about the good that you've done. And my spirit grew faint. It got worse as I read the Bible, not better. Salah. Sit in that one for a minute. We're not going to because of time, but you, you, you get it. Read this on when you get home. It's good stuff. Psalm 77. But he says, my soul refused to be comforted. My soul wouldn't do it. Right? All right, next verses. He says, you, uh, fun fact, I don't know who you is in this. He says, you suddenly... Uh, he never in the Bible, like in the Hebrew, refers to God as if he's talking to him. He always says, I meditated on the Lord, I was thinking about the Lord, and the Lord did this, and the Lord did this. And then he says, you suddenly here. I'm going to assume it's God, but he could be talking to his grief as well. But he says, you kept my eyes from closing. I couldn't sleep. Like, I'm trying and they just pop right back open again because whoever you is, is keeping him awake, right? I was too troubled to speak. I, 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 what am I supposed to pray in this situation? I thought about the former days, the years long ago. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Hold on. Uh, yeah, 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 we're still good. Okay. I thought about the former days long ago, the years of long ago. I remembered my song in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject me forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? As in, has the love that God promised me finally run out? Has his promise failed for all time? You See what I'm talking about? Those voices that tell you God's mad, right? There they are. Next one. Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Is he mad at me? See it? It's right there. It's just written poetically. And then there's another Salah. So it's getting worse, not better. Verse 10 is super confusing in Hebrew. Number one, I don't understand it. And number two, it seems like most translators don't wholly understand it either because if you, if you do a verse study across all of the different versions of the English Bible, every single one of them says something different. Every single one of them. But I think that the NIV does the best job here because what we do know is this verse is the turning point. We have those moments of darkness, but there's got to be a time when we say, wait a second, that's enough. This is that verse. He says, then I thought. In, in Hebrew, he says he said it out loud, not thought. I said, right? To this I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. This is in God's hand. God's hand. Wait a second. I know who that is. I spend time with God and I remember who God is. So these emotions have to be wrong. It's got to be a lie. Because I know who my God is. And after that, we get to this. And this is really cool. 11 and 12. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, 
I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works, and I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. This is not written as I'm gonna. It's written as a command to himself. We don't have that in English. We don't have a command form to me. Right? When we say, I'm going to do it, we just mean like, you know, I will walk over there and do it sometime in the future. Right? He is commanding himself to do this. He is wrestling with his emotions. He has officially seen it. He says, wait a second, these emotions must be a lie. All right, body, time to get it together. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Now, in you guys' case, that might not be crossing the Red River in Egypt, but in his case, it is. Um, In you guys' case, that's personal, right? Remember what God did for you. If you don't have a list yet, that's okay. Start hanging out with him. He'll get you a list real fast because he wants to. He wants to give you a list 10 miles long of everything he's done for you. So he's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I will remember who God is for me. The demons are coming against that, and he's saying, no, I will remember. And in fact, that's why he says, I will remember twice. Right there. Yes, I will remember. That's an argument right there. First, he says, I will remember. And then he says, he uses the word key, and it's an, emph- it's an emphatic. It's an argumentative word. So it's like, no, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Oh, yeah, but what about? No, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. He's arguing with his only emotions because they don't get to define who God is. God is better than how we feel, even when we feel he's good. He's better than we could ever imagine. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles. Now he's talking to God. I'm not talking to the demon anymore. I'm not talking to my body anymore because I know who has the masterhood of this situation. And you're right there and I will remember you. I have commanded myself to remember who you are. He says, I will consider. Same verbiage. Same self-command. I will consider your works. See, first he says, I remember your deeds. It's basically the same word. But he's arguing with those emotions, and he's not going to stop until they go away. Because now what he's learned is the emotions are the problem. He prayed God was good. God heard him already. And God was already going to satisfy that situation. His emotions are now the problem because they're what's out of line. And so he's going to keep telling them to be quiet until they do. And so he says, I will consider your works. And then this is the reason I said, and I will meditate. Because meditate, same word. And I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. Guess what the psalmist did? Exactly that. The rest of this song is remembering what God did for him. And then the rest of the next psalm, he wrote two. (laughs) The rest of the next psalm is an even longer list of everything God did for him. Because he was going to make sure that every emotion he had knew the truth. And he meant it. You have authority over how you feel. You can tell your feelings to shut it off. If I have prayed to my God that loves me, then he already heard And he's already taken care of it. In fact, he was probably already working on taking care of it because he knew I'd ask. When When Moses is talking to God as a burning bush, he says, but God, I don't know how to talk to people. He says, I know, Aaron's on his way. Aaron was already halfway there. God takes care of it ahead of time because he knows you're going to ask. 
So ask. Ask, because he knows you're going to ask. But trust me, he's already taken care of it. That's good stuff. But once you've done that, if you still feel that anxiety, if you still feel that depression, if you still feel that God's mad at me, that God's not good, now your emotions are what's wrong. It wasn't you for asking God for help. And it's not God because he's taking care of it because he loves you. It's your emotions that need to fix. And you have the authority to tell them to stop. I got some homework because I'm a teacher. Make a list. Make a list of what God has done for you. And like I said, if he hasn't yet, that's okay. Just hang out with him for a little while. He'll give you a list. He will give you a list. You'll be like, wait, I wasn't even allowed to talk to this person two weeks ago, and now I'm taking them to dinner. Uh huh. That's, your, that's part of your list, Amen. right? You'll be like, man, I, 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 gosh, I, I could give you a thousand examples, but I don't need to. You have the examples. God's telling you the examples right now. You're thinking about them, and that's true because those things will change as God is with you. Make a list of what he's done for you, And then when you're feeling that other way, go back over that list. Let God remind you who he is. None of us in this church that have been going at any length of time here are the same people that we were when we stepped through those doors. And that was all God. He's not abandoned you now. He didn't bring you here just to say, I was just kidding, I don't like you. He didn't do that. He's got all of it. Every anxiety, every fear, every worry, every stressful situation, he's already taking care of it. Give it to him, and if your emotions are still off, tell them to shut up. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord God, we pray a special blessing over everybody who came into this house today. We pray that your presence would walk with them daily this week, that your hedge of protection would be around them this week, that when they have divine appointments in their lives, they would answer them this week, and that your healing, blessing, loving, tender, caring mercies would be with them all week long. And we pray that when they come back next week, they would only be multiplied, not lessened. In Jesus Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen.